Um, I'm Jake Garcia from the Department of Comparative Literature. I want to welcome everybody to today's discussion of sentient flesh, uh, thinking and disorder of belief system black. Um, as somebody said, it's an extraordinarily gratifying and special thing to have already with us today and for two days actually. Uh, tomorrow at this time, he will be delivering a lecture, the title of which is The Idea of Reading for Parasemiosis and Poetic Sociologies. I'll take place just down the street in Silver. Uh, so please register for that if you have not done so already. Um, RA is the friend of the department, uh, and it's great to have him here. So as to make the most of the limited time we have, I will, um, we have a limited block per COVID uh, regulations. I'll have these will be brief introductions. Uh, there's much more to say about the work of all of our speakers today. Uh, but to begin, Ari Judy is professor of critical and cultural studies at the University of Pittsburgh and author of Disforming the American Canon, African, African Arabic, Slate Narratives, and the Vernacular. Ari works in a range of areas, black critique, the history of ideas, cultural studies, contemporary Arabic literature and thought, political philosophy, epistemology, and poetics. He's a comparatist who teaches in the fields of Comparative literature, black critique, oral literature, a particular emphasis on Arabic and African literature, as well as semiotics and literary theater. He is behind a series of special issues and dossiers for Boundary 2 that have become essential reading, and these include the Tunisia dossier, uh, 2012, uh, Sociology Hesitant, uh, Du Bois's Dynamic Thinking, um, among several others. His articles and essays are many, and I just wanted to single out one which overlaps with the concerns of sentient flesh, and that is restless flying of black study of revolutionary humanism to Puritan Boundary 2, where he describes black study as, quote, a view in flight, or, quote, being with one another in flight. Um, and uh, he talks about this as, in some ways, the basis of black study, the stuff of revolutionary or radical humanism, which may come up later, later today. He's, of course, the author of Sentient Flesh, Picking in Disorder, Poesis in Black, an enormous achievement published in uh, 2020. As Tony Bokes has said, it provides one of the most critical arguments available in contemporary humanities. We'll also hear today from uh, Emmanuel Bianchi, uh, who is Associate Professor of Comparative Literature with Affiliations in Classics and Gender and Sexuality Studies at NYU. She's the author of The Feminine, the Feminine Symptom, Aleatory Matter and the Aristotelian Cosmos of Fordham. Uh, University Press 2014, uh, co-editor with Sarah Brill and Brooke Holmes of Ant Antiquities Beyond Humanism from Oxford 2019, and a collection of her essays is currently being translated into Spanish uh, under the title uh, Thesis Eros. Emma publishes on questions of nature and gender in Greek antiquity, and then feminist philosophy more generally. Recent offerings include a keyword essay in matter uh, in the Bloomsbury Handbook in, of 21st Century Feminist Theory, and reading speculum again, narrative object, optics, time, forthcoming and edited volume, what is sexual, what is sexual difference, making the reader eye. Our other speaker is Fred Moten, uh, Fred is a professor of performance studies in the Tisch School of the Arts, as well as a professor in comparative literature at NYU. Um, he is the author of a number of works, many of which uh, you will know, and I'll mention just a few. In the break, the aesthetics of the black radical tradition, Minnesota 2003. The three-volume collection of essays, whose general title is "Consent Not to Be Single, Not to Be a Single Being," uh, from Duke Press, 2017 and 2018. Um, his collections of poetry include Hugh Jenkins, The Field Trio, and Little Edges, uh, among others. With Stephen O'Harney as co-author, Fred wrote "The Undercommons: Fugitive Planning and Black Study" uh, from 2013. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, Fred has served. Um, the editorial boards of Kellogg, Discourse, American Quarterly, Social Text, among others. For our purposes today, and I think Emily noted this, I want to mention the interview that Fred conducted with RA in Pages of Boundary 2, which is extraordinary uh, and rich in many ways, and in some ways uh, might be thought of as a prelude to the discussion today. I want to thank both Fred and RA for that interview. And I think what uh, we'll do is turn to the kind of formal part of today, the panel discussion, but I also hope that we'll have lots of time for questions and conversation uh, with audience members um, following that. Emma's going to start. First, uh, thank you so much, Jay, for, for putting this event together, uh, inviting me to participate on this panel. It's a true honor to be 
invited to this particular table uh, as a relative outsider to these debates and conversations. Um, I'd like to thank Michael Ernst, uh, our events organizer, for all the hard work that he's put in to this. And also, and most of all, I'd like to thank R.A. Judy for writing the extra this extraordinary, far ranging, far reaching book that is Sentient Flesh. Um, as provisos, I'm, I'm, I am in a somewhat awkward position since I come to this book as mostly outsider. Uh, someone trained in the history of Western philosophy, so far so good, who works primarily on issues of sex, gender, and sexuality in relation to Greek antiquity. As a teacher of classes on the body in philosophy, I have some familiarity with themes of flesh and materiality in contemporary Black studies as expressed in the work of figures such as Hortense Spillers, Alexander Wahelier, Sakia Iman Jackson, and Amber Musser, but I'm otherwise quite ill-equipped in the field. As such, there are some occasional points of uh, conjuncture or perhaps even points of incitement between my scholarly concerns and those developed in the book, which I hope will provide some fodder for discussion. And thankfully, sentient flesh in its almost 600 pages does not just argue about, but also leads us through, sometimes in dazzling detail, the thinking of uh, the many figures, themes, disciplinary scenes, and texts with which it engages in order to arrive at a full account of its main conceptual contributions. Sentient flesh itself, parasemiosis, uh, poiesis in black and thinking in disorder. While there are certainly resonances with other black studies projects, notably Denise Ferreira da de Silva's development of what she calls a black feminist poetics, Judy's work remains sui generis. It, its proliferating figures and themes cluster around, flow from and inform an understanding of two main guiding threads. The first of which is its epigraph, a 1937 quotation from Friedman Tom Wyndham, quote, I think we should have our liberty because us ain't hogs or all horses, us is human flesh, end quote. Judy returns to this remark again and again, noting among other things, the acquisition as well as opposition of livestock chattel on the one hand and the flesh designated as human in the first person plural on the other signifying a kind of being in community and plurality that for Judy Marks par excellence, the parasemiosis of poesis in black. The second guiding thread is the corpus of W.E.B. Du Bois, and especially chapter 13 of the Souls of Black Folk, the story called The Coming of John, whose themes are also treated in many different contexts and registers. And just to give a fleeting picture of the range and depth of the book, we learn in the course of its elaborations about the works and thinking of figures, including but not limited to Aristotle, Kant, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Husserl, Heidegger, Oscar Becker, William James, Wilhelm Dilthe, Jacques Lacan, Roland Barthes, the mathematicians Richard Dedekind and George Cantor, Hortense Spillers, Nahum Chandler, the novelist Nabil Fares, James Baldwin, Charles Baudelaire, Siegfried Krakauer, Zora Neale Hurston, and a variety of sociologists, anthropologists, ethnographers, and ethnomusicologists, including Marcel Griol, Michel Lois, Roger Bastide, John Avery and Alan Lomax, Lucy McKim, Lydia Parrish, and William Allen, not to mention many often anonymous singers and dancers in the African-American tradition. Given this enormous range, I can only, as I say, scrape the surface or really brush by certain moments of this compelling and beautifully written book. I should say it's a genuine pleasure to read. And as Judy explains, it's organized less into parts, sections, and chapters than into what we call sets, moments, and rips. The reader passes through a series of acquisitional unfoldings, flows and breaks, in which the enrichment, intensification, or really the fleshing out of the conceptual contributions takes place. Sets here can signify in many directions, the logical mathematical unit and set theory, the running order of a performance, the divisions of a tennis game or exercises at the gym. But experientially, 
These sections crash upon a reader like a series of waves which surface call sets, sometimes disorienting and upending expectations, and sometimes enabling one to ride out to an enormously satisfying conclusion. To briefly illustrate a particularly illuminating riff, the fourth of the second moment of the first set, we find a limpidly clear account of Hortense Spiller's field-defining and famously compact and dense essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, using the framework of ideology critique developed in Roland Barthes' essay, Myth Today, an essay only mentioned in passing by Spillers. The exposition here is a gift of painstaking analysis to which any teacher of this essay will be forever indebted. And it serves to illuminate with quite searing clarity the notion of sentient flesh Judy develops. The acts of violence meted out upon the bodies of slaves, the markings of which Spillers calls, quote, hieroglyphics of the flesh, end quote, shows this flesh by above to come to meaningfulness precisely as they, the acts of violence, naturalize upon the black body what is historical in the signifying operations of the modern mythology of racialized capitalism. And this flesh is shown by Judy in turn in the context of Wyndham's us is human flesh to be, quote, always already marked as interpolated in some signifying system, end quote, end quote. So just as the violence of slavery reduces black bodies to flesh, and that flesh consequently hovers indeterminately between nature and culture in vestibularity, in Spiller's powerful analysis inflected by Barr, so, Judy argues, quote, rather than giving temporal primacy to flesh as the stolen sign, Wyndham's statement presumes that meaning and form are expressed spontaneously. The flesh is with and not before the body and person, and the body and person are with and not before or even after the flesh. Lives life as flesh, oh, sorry, or even after the flesh. Further, he writes, quote, the point is that Wyndham's person is extricably of the flesh, lives life as flesh, end quote. Here there is no originary signified prior to the historical context, which is then marked by that context as the source of meaning making. Rather, flesh itself, a sentient, feeling, thinking, signifying, multiplies meaning and possibilities in its own living plurality not in a simple journey of expression, but in, this in the uneven activity of parasemiosis. I was particularly excited to see in this section that Judy invokes not only Bart, but also Aristotle in the course of reading this text, as I've also sought in my own thinking some common ground between the essentially normative thinking of coming to be in Aristotle and Bart's critical semiological analysis of the naturalization of a historical situation by which certain signifiers are converted into self-evident signifiers and are thus activated as ideological signs. But Judy's use and engagement with Aristotle, especially his notion of poiesis, hacked from him, as he says, following Ferreira de Silva, in order to, quote, release its radical possibilities, end quote, is certainly provocative and uh, deserves closer attention. Following Aristotle's poetics, Judy notes that the term poiesis, which means making more generally, the making of any artifact, but in this context, the specific making of literary texts, poetry, epic, lyric, and tragic, is closely allied to mimesis, which means most of all for Aristotle, the imitation of an action. This is sharply distinguished from Plato's mimesis, which is modeled chiefly on the notion of visual representation, and which always represents a partializing degradation of form. What is central for Judy here is that poiesis as my mimesis, quote, formally exhibits what it exposits, a change in action in a duration of time, end quote, and that it therefore connotes quote, human creating in semiosis, insane possibility, end quote. This creating is in time, embodied and affective as well as conceptual, and 
following the Arabic philosophers, Ibn Sina or Abi Sana, Ibn Rushd or Averroes, and Al Farabi, among others, he argues that this affective creation articulates and sustains an aesthetic community and indicates ethical action living in community, what he calls poetic socialities that resonate with Fred Moten and Stefano Hwani's notion of the undercommons and Anthony Bogue's notion of, quote, common association. It's worth noting here that the Greek aesthesis denotes feeling and makes a good translation for the Latin-derived word sentience. This being in motion of the poetic process of poiesis is key for Judy. And in the context of the Spiller's analysis, we find a provocative comparison of the analysis of coming to be in the physics, in Aristotle's physics, and the specific kind of making that is poetic making, which I would like to briefly investigate and raise a question about. It is precisely in book one of the physics, after all, where Aristotle makes the innovation of the material cause in order to solve the precise problem of how something can come to be out of nothing out of what was not there before. The material cause, he says, persists through the development of a thing, from the absence of its form to its presence, and this will solve the problem of how new things will appear in the world, whether in art or nature. But in the very... Sorry, my last piece slipping, I need to adjust it properly. But in the very same moment that he introduces this innovation, he also, this is Aristotle, he also divests matter precisely of its capacity to move itself, rendering it passive, and I would insist abject. So just as the carpenter, as maker, acts upon wood, dead wood, hule, to create the bed, uh, the, and, uh, the mother, and that's by introducing into it form and motion from the outside, so in natural coming to be, we now understand the father's seed acting upon the mother's passive menstrual blood to imbue the offspring with both form and motion. And if we move to another of Aristotle's favorite examples, we could also say that the doctor acts upon the patient's body, now rendered passive, to imbue it with the art of medicine, the movement and form that will produce health. The resonance is here with the abjected flesh in Spiller's analysis of shattered kinship bonds, fleshly and symbolic, in Mama's Baby are clear. And they stand perhaps in a certain conflict with Judy's analysis of the act of techne poietike, the art of making, as a resource here for poiesis in black. Judy instead takes up the three elements of Aristotle's analysis in the poetics, and these are namely, number one, mimetic media, that's rhythm, music, and language. Number two, mimetic object, the person's portrayed. And number three, mimetic modality, this could be epic, lyric, or tragedy. And he analogizes each of these with the material cause, formal cause, and moving cause, respectively. But since, as we have seen, matter has been divested of all motion in Aristotle's causal account, and the source of motion, or archaekinasios, is illustrated by Aristotle as the father, in the case of natural coming to be, or an advisor or maker in technical coming to be, it simply cannot hold, I think, that rhythm, music, and language can represent material cause. Rather, as I read it, the scene of poetic production and in the poetics begins from the assumption of a complete totality, something perfect and well-formed, made by the poietes, the poet or maker, uh, who is definitionally masculine here. And his production, namely the best tragedy, Oedipus Rex, can then be analogized with a healthy adult organism in the excellence and well-formedness of its constitution. Aristotle will then proceed by breaking the tragedy down into its elements or parts and showing how they work together. But it seems to me that none of these parts will co correspond directly to any of the four causes as analyzed in the physics, since all of them involve action and movement. And really any sense of the abjective embodiment indicated by Spiller's notion of flesh has long fallen away. But perhaps this is part of the point. Um, uh, I just want to just 
emphasize, however, that the poet or tragedian in this case is already one of the kalos gagathos, the elite men of Athens, who certainly live in a form of ideal sociality, in reciprocal friendship and ruling by turns, representing noble action through poetic making with their free time, and supported entirely by the invisible scaffolding of slaves and women, and women that make their form of excellent living possible. Any hacking of Aristotle's notion of poiesis will, it seems to me, need to reckon with this difficulty. Um, and just, just to be clear, this analysis of, a, of a, um, 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 Greek elite societies subtended by this scaffolding is, uh, is, is, is described in great and, uh, and clear detail by Julie in another section of the book. So this is also to read one section of the book against another section and not just do a, an external critique. Um, the question thus may become to invoke another part of sentient flesh. Is there a way to return movement to matter? So that it may move itself so as to create meaning and possibilities in community to allow the appearance of parasemiosis and poiesis in black as in the dances of the juba and the buzzard lope analyzed in the second set of the book motility kinesis arguably aristotle's problematic are also the central problematics of sentient flesh but Aristotle really also inaugurates the divesting uh, uh, of matter of its motion for the Western tradition in his causing of the causes. If we follow this thread back behind Aristotle and Plato to pre-Socratic thinking, where elements are always understood as possessing their own motion, and this conceptual divestment has not yet begun, we may find ourselves in the terrain of Nietzsche's Dionysus, also dancing to the beat of the dithyram and dissolving the boundaries of the enclosed individual. This disaggregating and pluralizing force that is also, however, cruel and destructive is also beautifully analyzed in sentient flesh. Nietzsche's destructive mastery, however, is also in the domain of what Marilyn Fry has called, quote, arrogant perception. The tendency of those in power to arrogate others to serve their interests, not only in practice, but at the very level of perception. Judy shows how Du Bois answers this idea of a strong man with his conception of the submissive man, less a craven submissive man, but more a flexible and responsive, uh, uh, a res but, more respect but more flexible and responsive to his surroundings perhaps with some commonalities with what Latina philosopher Maria Lugones calls loving perception, a counter to arrogant perception. Mining Aristotle and the poiesis of tragedy for their liberty, liberatory dimensions may pose, certain difficulty, may pose certain difficulties and yet not prove impossible, as I think we see clearly in Judy's fine analysis of Du Bois's The Coming of John. In a sense, it is hard not to read the coming of John as almost entirely conforming to the most excellent of tragic plots as defined by Aristotle's poetics. And I'm just gonna very kind of briefly summarize the story for, for those who don't know it, but uh, uh, to, to emphasize this. Uh, we have a hero, John Jones, perhaps a little better than us in his character, talents and aspirations, leaving to seek his fortune he meets his hometown double, the white John Henderson in New York, city of crossroads by chance and fails to recognize him. He is found by dint of his race to have committed an inadvertent sexual transgression in the form of a casual touch against John's female companion while watching Wagner's Mohan Green. Later, he returns to his hometown whose people he is now estranged from due to his education and his double, by dint of his race, commits an overt sexual transgression against his, John Jones, own sister. He kills his white double with a branch that echoes the tree upon which he himself will be lynched. Not divine ordinance, but historical conditions seal his dreadful fate. And yet, in the moment when the inevitable approaches, in the form of the lynch mob, he hears the swan song of low and green and the whistle of the wind. 
Evident throughout the story are the elements of tragedy as delineated by Aristotle, reversal and recognition, a theme of doubles, a chance that is not a chance, the arousal of pity and fear, every requisite device, and yet Judy resists the tragic reading of this story. Surely his right to resist the Schopenhauerian, Schopenhauerian reading of the story as producing resignation, as the will meets its absolute resistance and finds itself powerless. Such a reading is suggested by Du Bois' own Germanist training and is argued for, for example, by Paul Kirkman. It is, of course, in the sound of the swan song and in the whistle of the wind, in whose Wagnerian echoes of living on and possibility so alive for Du Bois, where transformation may be seen to take place, that Judy finds the aesthetic operations of parasemiosis and poiesis in black to be at work. Here, in this sonic aesthetic terrain, there is much that resonates with other strands of contemporary black studies, especially those proffered in the work of Fred Moten. But in these Wagnerian strains in Du Bois that signify beyond the 19th century dialectic of freedom and necessity, might we also hear a persistence of a feminine strain, a poetical strain. After all, the Goethe Dameron of the Ring Cycle, after the Goethe Dameron of the Ring Cycle, only the water, the earth, and the Rhine maidens remain. And these two surely signify in a way that we might also read through Judy's parasemiosis. Let us therefore add Judy's thinking to a tradition of reading tragedy that, tragedy that does not run aground on the shoals of Schopenhauerian resignation, but rather attends to the generative possibilities of the doubling it continually raises and works through. What Rainer Schormann, drawing on Sophocles as Antigone, calls amphinoine, thinking from two sides. Or what we might with Du Bois, and now returning to the specific specificity of black life and practice called double consciousness. Thank you. We just decided the orders. I'm going to go next. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then back up. Thank you so much, Emma. That's fantastic. Um, as already Judy tells us early on in Sentient Flesh, the terms he will develop are arrayed in relation to something. That something is at times designated as racialized capitalist slavery, but it's also called something more generic in the introduction. It can also be summarized and summoned for narrative purposes as, quote, the epistemology of raciology and the concomitant anthropology predominant in capitalist modernity. Before we are given a full elaboration of Judy's main theoretical terms, the ground is prepared for them by parentheses, and in particular, its verb form to parenthesize. Processes of parenthesization are at the center of the story Judy presents. We could say that finding what is happening amid and alongside the epistemology of raciology creates both the aim and the searching quality of the book. It's not difficult to see why parenthesization becomes important. It is a way to think, process, or the processual in ways that cannot be subsumed by the epistemology of raciology, even as the force of raciology and its myriad manifestations remain nearby. Parentheses so that we can think appositionally, alongside, side by side. Parenthesization allows sentient flesh to think and read nimbly about those things raciology cannot vanquish, namely, quote, practices of living, which articulate conceptions of, of humanity that are appositional to not only raciology, but the larger existential condition of disorder that it helps to bring to life. By R.A. Judy's lights, uh, W.B. Du Bois is, is among those who most helps us conceive of intelligence as a practice, one of, the pra one of those practices of living. Du Bois is interested in, quote, life practices and multiplicities of discrete things that people do as Judy says in, in an interview. Here then, I want to stress the doing, every, the doing everywhere implied in the use of parenthesis. To identify a parenthesizing process is to designate the doing of something. To think to voice from this angle, from the angle of practices of living, and from the perspective of things that people do, is in sentient flesh to produce another Du Bois. And in fact, to think of Du Bois as a doer of thought. A different Du Bois from most accounts, certainly from the historicist biographical variety. 
I won't be able to do justice in my remarks to all the ways that Judy gives us this Jibbun Du Bois, but I want to point to a few things that make sentient flesh feel like a new moment when it comes to readings of Du Bois. One way to begin would be to pause over the figure of Josiah Royce. Historians have discussed Du Bois's involvement with the thinking of the Harvard philosopher. But Judy offers a way to think, uh, a way into Du Bois that makes him uh, into a theorist of practices of living, which has to do with the ways he reads and the ways he reads Royce in particular. To put it succinctly, by its deliberations on Royce, Du Bois does not come to see thinking as material agency, but rather arrives at the view that, quote, thinking is material agency. Royce's idea of universal thought is then parsed in this way, the dynamic unfolding of the world as contingency, the cumulative effect of human cognitive activity in common relation to things, including itself. Delving into Du Bois's notebooks, Judy accesses the ways the Roycean corpus is working on Du Bois, which is, of course, at the same time, a reworking of Royce. We are then able to notice the resonance between Royce's universal thought and what Du Bois will call intellect and action. A related but slightly different Royce uh, from the one that concerns Judy shows up in a 1908 book called Race Questions, Provincialism, and Other American Problems. There, with some prescience, Royce will say, quote, a nation composed of many millions of people may fall rapidly under the hypnotic influence of a few leaders, a few fatal phrases. There are two things that, that stand out in this, I think. One is the focus on leadership, which will also concern to voice. And second, the question of how things, persons, discourses to acquire hypnotic power. For me, then, one of the questions of sentient flesh is how to discover what is happening alongside, oppositionally, to the hypnotization of Bennett's race theology. To return to Du Bois, given the many intricate ways that Judy reads Royce and Du Bois together, we can say that one of the upshots is that we find in Du Bois's practices something like dehypnotizing thinking. That is, Du Bois is ever helping us to notice the persistent hypnotizations of race theology. This comes across in the brilliant reading of the 1890 Harvard commencement address Du Bois gave, and which he titled Jefferson Davis as representative of civilization. Leadership is one of Du Bois's topics, and it is, it is the archetype of the strong man as the default configuration of leadership that concerns him. He explores Jefferson Davis as an instantiation of the strong man. In one of the funniest pages of Sentient Flesh, we encounter reviews of Du Bois's address in The Nation magazine and elsewhere that find him using impressive moderation and good taste in his handling of Jefferson Davis, who had died six months earlier. The reviews miss Altogether, the ironizing impulse running through the, through the address. It's an ironizing that is not wrathful, but that powerfully opens up questions that extend beyond Davis to the elevation with the national and state formation of the strong man's egotistical self-aggrandizement and assertion of, of the I, as Judy puts it. In contradistinction to, the dynamic, to that dynamic, Du Bois spoke of a non-egotistical manifestation of intellect in action. Through the doctrine of the submissive man, which cannot be thought of as a mere opposite of the strong man, Du Bois displaces the historiography of civilization that relies on the strong man as its anchoring sensibility. What is offered in its place is the possibility of what R.I. Judy calls a figure of being in common with one another, a figure that could serve as the basis for viable, sustainable, worldly collectivity. I want to have time to uh, touch on all the parts of, of the Bravora reading of Du Bois's address, uh, but I do want to emphasize that in the back of all of it is the question of the human, or through the address and in other writings, Du Bois is exploring the quote, severely limited syntax of Western civilization's conception of the human, to quote one of the book's most remarkable and haunting lines. Concerned with the strong man, Du Bois anticipates Foucault on sovereignty. We could also say that Du Bois anticipates later, late Royce, for it is for his concern with Jefferson Davis, is he not talking about the very hypnotic influence of a few leaders to which Royce refers? One to suggest that sentient flesh is not only reads Du Bois. As a student of Western civilization's hypnotized formations, but, but that R.A. Judy himself could be said to make dehypnotization a feature of his own enunciated acts. He does so in part by insisting upon persona, which will come into his reading of Du Bois and also enters his riveting reconsideration of Mama's baby, Papa's maybe. Persona as practice and an idea can never be fully folded into race theology or made to comply with the, that limited syntax of the human that we've inherited, according to the book. But it's perhaps worth noting that, that, per, that the persona he gives us differs from the persona as treated by others. Here, thinking of Giorgio Agamben's claim that persona came over time to, quote, signify the juridical capacity and political dignity of the free man. 
and its second flesh, persona retains its salience even amid racialized slavery in its afterlives. The book scrambles or disarranges the government's formula. That his duty holds on to persona as that which remains and then remains again, even amid the condition of existential disorder. Here, once more, voices of some interest. Uh, for sentient flesh would seem to be of a piece with voices Royce in at least a few respects. Substituting persona for individual in Royce, we find him saying the following A realm of genuinely spiritual individuality, in which uh, is one where each persona has its own unique significance, so that none can take another's place, but just for that very reason, all of the unique personas of the truly spiritual order stand in relation to the same universal light. If we, are to, if we are to an extent given a Roycean Du Bois by Ari Judy, we are invited, I think, also to consider the Roycean affinities or, or perhaps desires of sentient flesh. But then there is flesh, which is not in Royce. Uh, in closing, I want to just say a few things from this. Uh, it's crucial to note that persona could not, could not be separated from flesh in the model of weeding that Judy gives us. There is no moment when flesh is not already entailed in some sort of semiosis, Judy has said. Moreover, he adds that we can think of it as an we can think of it flesh as an inerasable constitutive element in the articulation of thinking. There is always writing with the flesh, not just writing upon the flesh, uh, which for Judy brings to mind the palimpsest. We can say that the voicing concerns with relationality and collectivity are being rethought in sentient flesh. We thought with flesh as ongoing symbiosis, flesh as living palimpsest. What is sentient flesh then, if not itself something processual, process of renewal and reinvention? Thanks. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank Emily and thank Emma, thank Jay for organizing everything, especially thank Ari. Um, so, it's a long thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it goes back really for me um, to May of 1986. This was the first time I met Ari um, at a conference in Berkeley where I was finishing my first year in graduate school. And the conference was called The Nature and Context of Minority Discourse. And it was a kind of extraordinary moment. Um, it was not only the first time that I met Ari, it was also the first, or really the only time actually I've ever seen. Sylvia Winter in person. She gave an extraordinary talk that that week or weekend called uh, on disenchanting discourse. Um, that same conference, Barbara Christian gave an extraordinary talk called the race to fear. Um, a few months later, in the fall of '86, Hortense Spillers came to Berkeley. And gave a version of Mama's Baby and Papa's Baby before it was published in 87. So for me, these were <laughs> utterly formative experiences. RA talked um, and gave us a preview of the work that would eventually be published in his great book, Disforming the American Can in 92 or 93. And uh, the only thing wrong with sentient flesh is that it might give people the excuse not to, to go back and read this form in the American <laughs> and, um, Sometimes a, a next book, when it's so long awaited and so long anticipated and so utterly well prepared, it seems like it can displace the first one, but they, they also exist opposition with regard to one more. And have to be have to be read together. So um, so this is so this is a great indicator <laughs> for me. And um, now what I'm going to do is really give you a a reading of I suppose a, a early response um, 
to a draft of, of sentient flesh that was part of what emerged in the conversation between R.A. and I uh, in that sort of interview that, that previews sentient flesh that Emily spoke of that was published in Boundary 2. Um, uh, somewhere, I guess I suppose, I exist in some interstitial space between poetry and criticism, which I guess, to me, clearly this is the case now in the wake of reading RA, that interstitial space you know, also happens to be the, the place of black study, of, of poesis, of parasimiosis. And, uh, and I just wanted to read what I guess is some verse that purely exists as a function of my response to RA. So this is a response <laughs> for me. Um, no, I don't, I don't mean to be cheating, but, but I did want to go to this. And I, and I wanted to, mostly I wanted, to, wanted him to hear it, hear me say it out loud. So thank you for letting me do this. This is from a book of mine um, that came out a couple years ago called All That Beauty. And it's from a long sort of serial poem called Come On, Get It. And I'm going to read sections, I think 14 through 17, but I won't read the numbers. What's it feel like to see through blackness? Mixing singing and drowning, sounding and dancing, but hesitating forever to be a signal or a judge. This they ask on holiday in protest of themselves, surrounded by themselves in bolts of blue though that honorable fabric don't feel so good. Whiteness is the set of interpersonal relations. The interpersonal is an intrapersonal fantasy. The intrapersonal is an impersonal fantasy. The impersonal fantasy of the intrapersonal is your picture, imagination in the law of solitude. On the other hand, in which this same hand is held off blue, an extra person folded. The image of hands held and folded, sociality, blackness, is unavailable, but the tangle, sociality, blackness, infuses every image. My black death is my debut, my soul, done up in blueprint blue. It sure looks good on me, it just don't feel so good to disappear in a loose arrangement of flowers. Slave narrative ain't the genre in which one gives an account of slavery and oneself. Slave narrative is the disappearance of oneself and the diffusion of slavery in the given, which can't be accounted for, of the account. Sounding drowning's loose arrangement. Just be making something all the time so you can use it to be making something with somebody all the time. Maybe the distinction is between empathy and empathy. One emerging from a point of view, the other occurring in splinter and entwined, tearing, tearing, but which knows which is which. Maybe it all goes back to that same black athenic vehemence and passion, an infeeling of outness sung for the caravan. Look how she crossed. She ain't talking about the game. She from around the way of ain't no way. and ain't no nonviolent way to look at it. The camera pans down, moves down, spiraling into the wine and urine stained hallway. And what the camera moves toward as I, I, a hand that somehow was and is the camera, the hands gesture at and with in all this beauty as the camera's motion is having fallen in followingness is all that you. Whiteness is a set of interpersonal relations, a tractor being for the placement of earth, miscreants trying to put where they live in their pockets. As we have not and we are not, but we share space time, sheer and shards, JB Lenoir of the lived experience. Black affects fact, the null, the Pan-African hunch, 
that mess up the genuine art. Resistance is an atmospheric condition whose relation to power, which is derivative of resistance, is derivation itself. Derivation turns relation inside out. Preservative, explosive, unrestricted in doctrine, like a ship upon the sea. We tend to think anti-blackness is the denial of personhood to black persons. It's also the imposition of personhood on black. It's raining, man, and I wish it would rain. But looking back on when I was a little nappy headed boy, back when we entered Black Study, my feelings began to get their exercise elsewhere along the road to my disappearance. Is there an etymological and then perhaps conceptual connection between a parent and a parent? Chill. So, so beautiful, you let me disappear. Rhythmic placelessness is our garden and folding, bending, and pumping. Back to living again with its inborn recursion is prophylactic to any future metaphysics or an anti metaphysics or a preface that can't stop coming. We share the preservation of placelessness under the duress of placement to be put in place and kept in place, to be conferred a place and to have to have it, to have to own it, to have to try to keep it, to have a body imposed upon one as one's place, one's simultaneous foundation and incarceration and denial of N plus one is monocultural sugar for your golden bowl. Our mupa, all out from and all up under, and all over all, and all of anyone's ownership of solid, subdivided ground, turns transubstantiation co-substantial. Comida, comodida. That's not your body, that's my body. As she almost says, she almost says. As there they go all falling, all falling out together, dislocating, differentiating mass. The celebration of the mess and mass displacement, the unruly animonastic dispersion and cenobitic diffusion, and as such, in all its affirmative force, the preserved and placeless place, the gateless, blood stained gate. Wu says Black women say they hear their babies they can't have be trying to say. The view they walk, vestibular blur. Be mule bone blue, deep in blue, blue spill for the losers of the world, which the soloist, who is not one, impersonates as a circular thrill of floating, recircular feet. Let our flesh be shared, shard, shield, she. It's hard, damn, it's quick, incarnate, incomplete. The thing Rob calls the event of the Negro is the sign of reviled, refused, recombinant generality. The sheer Ellingtonian, wrapped around the wooing presence of the absence in the instrument, which is there in the presence of the instrument, which is there in the elegant recess of art surrounding deep in the edge of sound. Some of them asking in a migrant chords and breaks about release, some possible one, two, that won't take anybody's fixed position. It's some degenerate, satin generative. Rock says individuation, and the individual is not just not one, they are more generally split and supernumerary, some kind of pair paired, paired individual, an impaired individuation whose design is pointed toward a self whose business is in the street, open, processual, but dignified at the gig, with that fly-ass gig. Raw side signs intellect in action, sign a favorite phrase of Du Bois playing, impersonated. In an open set, 
with open sets of unsettled, unsettling green, handed sheets. There's something other than himself, which is as it should be, which is how he is. This continual calling us out our name in love, how we open up somehow, sometimes, rubbing something in and out of the way of things, popular, all out of place, portable, as the sound we see in the surround, Ross says, as he always be saying, like Barack always be saying, that militant leather, grieve and move and celebrate that we are immense. What if you mess it all up? Then you can't tell us how it is. What if the umbrella underneath which the visual and individual, singular and multiple, severable and asunder don't quite live is the merely conceptual condition of separation, which feels so good when you rub up on it, that pulse comes to an end in sheets of rain and killing moon and thin derivative. Then you can't tell us how we want. What if the relation, which is the place between placelessness, timelessness, and inseparability, is no count after all? Like BB's unbearable phrasing on how blue. Can you get to that system? Can time travel on this trail? Then maybe vision is the hidden sand, proto Indo European root. Vague to separate, proto Indo European root, vague to see, as if to separate is to see, as if separation is at first an ordering of the scene that is more fundamentally an ordering and scene. What if to think in disorder, like Ra, like Denise's song, flew, is to think outside ordered scene? The sound of that drop in H resplendent in Hester, regiven by brother. What if this interplay of ordering and seeing is solitary confinement? What if disorder is having a party in the givenness of the party? Ra plays the companionship of sentient flesh, thinking in disorder and experience in sunlit placelessness till we're all the way out of our damn minds in another story in half-leaf shape. It is the problem of the maintenance of separation, the maintenance of the maintenance of separation, where you are seen. I see you. Happy now, motherfucker? Then saving is the blur that movement makes and not around. I just didn't give him permission to say nothing at all. But it's probably taking time to say what I want to, but. I want to thank uh, none of the actors and uh, Jay Garcia for making this part. I want to thank uh, Jay for his uh, diligence, patience, uh, and intellectual uh, generosity. He quickly came in, finally, it's happened after many discussions. But those were always invigorating discussions about matters of importance. And we never just talk business. Yeah. And talk the business of talking. I thank Michael for uh, the logistical help he's given, which has been truly uh, essential. I don't have to tell you all the bureaucratic labyrinth of CMYU from outside of the community. <laughs> and I want to thank my, my, my dear, dear friend, uh, Fred Milton. I'll have some more things to say about him. <laughs> For being a silent uh, force in all this. Uh, this is my first time uh, speaking uh, in the context of comparative literature at NYU, and I sincerely hope it's not my last. Uh, tomorrow, I think we'll settle that, whether you like me or not. <laughs> <laughs> I like it.
Thank you, uh, 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 Manuela. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Craig. Manuela, thank you very much. Um, I take seriously your claims to be wanting an expertise, and then I dismiss them because your performance can't be good. And, and a work like this, and I very much am flattered by it, and I want it reaches across. So, so your your incitements, I will. Um, um, I'm truly humbled. Having said that, I want to take up the incitement of Aristotle. Because we agree. And, and you know, as you mark in the text, I'm messing with the man in a very specific way. And and the uh, the deadening of matter is so problematic in his work as he's doing, which he always wrestles with as he tries to formulate the legitimacy of his epistemic. But it's haunting, it's there, it won't go away. And this is what interested me about it. What, what's at stake? You know, why does he elaborate my nieces? I fall away in the opening four books where it's a species activity and of the action of being and being in speaking possibility. Maybe we know. And yet, shut it down. That's what I wanted to explore. Now, I've learned a lot from you, and in the next version, I'll avoid some of those traps, which really is about foregrounding the way in which you get into it. Having said that, in his exposition of the four causes, I'm struck at the echo across the corpus, from the physics to the ethics, to the poetics, to the rhetoric, the entire organ. This is a governing structure, for me, as governing as his hierarchical binary. And, and it, it seems to me that what's very much at stake in that is the fragility of intelligence, that is to say, his conceived birth. He doesn't quite, I wouldn't say believe it, it doesn't work. Okay? It's like it's like Kant with the problem of finding the bounds of being. You can't find any definition, so you have to have word which just keep talking. So so I took that very much from your from your remarks, and I thank you. Thank you. You understood the polyvalence of sex wonderfully. Every single one of those is what was at play. <laughs> I'm not in every single one of them, right? And if you look at the structure of the uh, table of contents, there's also a, a rhyming scheme that explains the history with this as well, right? Because what's what's at play in all of those 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 elements is it's every motion. It's action. It's action. And in that regard, again, what I sought, and I think you caught well, is to find some way of understanding the activity of questions. Jay. Jay. I, I once gave a talk at Vancouver uh, at the Hellenistic uh, Studies Conference. For some reason, I find myself hanging out a lot with classicists and presenting scholars. That has something to do with my my Arabic corruption, I suppose. And uh, the organizer, Demetrius, took me aside and remarked after my talk, this is the thing you do where you open up the parentheses. And then a parenthesis in the parenthesis, and then a parenthesis within that parenthesis, and it brings us back to the closure of all those parentheses in such a way as we follow you. This is a rhetorical trick. You've caught me, man. Parenthesis is very much part of what the structure of this is about, and especially with, with regards to trying to establish a particular rhythm. Um, um, I would hope that you would know it that the recurrence of the wind in the mark is along the lines of a fume. Royce and Du Bois is a fraught subject and not sufficiently studied. 
I very much appreciate your deep knowledge of what's in the engagement. Uh, and 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 indeed, I do think that that Roy's uh, 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 rather than James shines a certain light on the kind of thinking that the boys want to do. And I think it's very, it's rather significant that the course in ethics the boys took, he had meant to take it with Roy's. The Harvard said, "Roy goes to distraction." That he had made this breakdown when he was in Australia. And the one time in the history of his career at the university, James thought it was there. <laughs> and, and of course, the, the marginal notes that James did on the voices paper uh, 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 for that class really does speak to, uh, speak to the difference between E. James and voice and the voice of orientation that put together. Alongside is indeed the reward of the day, the day to be alongside, to be alongside, uh, to, to scramble in that regard for a fleshly account of persona, which which I I look carefully at at four things, but I also look at the classical sense of persona as the mask, and and the mask that 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 um, um, uh, invokes the ancestor. That, that you know enabled the house to rise into the ranks of the elite. And in that respect, I want to go back to Manuela's remarks. Indeed, the problem throughout the text is how can we think past the, the hierarchical binary of the and, and this 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 crosses issues of class, issues of race, and issues of gender. And, and we're still tracking. This is why indeed I try to scramble Agamben's formula for some. And, and you'll note that I did that without even mentioning it. Fred. That's quite a poem, man. <laughs> Sounding, drowning in loose arrangement, the imposition of person and black. But the only person there who calls me Ra is because RA stands for Ronald Kaplan Mukhari, but nobody can say that. I like it when you say Ra, man. Uh, it gives me, uh, uh, gives me aspiration. It pushes me to a certain kind of foolish fantasy. Oh, Sun Ra! <laughs> you know, because I'm one of those frustrated failed musicians who keeps trying to push my own project closer to the wonderful magic of that, of that form. The event of the movie. Can you get it, sister? Those two lines answer them. The entire book was an effort to try to account for the way we are in eventfulness. In, in spite of which is what I mean by acquisition, in spite of the discourses of monumentalization, arrest, deadening, what I call the eschatological questions of man that fix it. So I thank you, uh, three, for uh, uh, giving me more thought than I can adequately address in these few moments. It's always a difficult task because. One is torn between wanting to simply meditate upon what's been said about one's work and, and simply um, 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 humble that it would be taken so seriously and read so carefully and so generously. So I thank you all again for your generosity. And I hope I've said enough to give you cause to argue with me for <laughs>